There's two models of Jabiru. This is the larger edition one. You can tell by the larger windows in the back and by that third door back there. This is an unusual light sport aircraft in that it has three doors. We'll come back to that in a moment because there's some reasons why it has that. Let's do a little bit of detail first. Starting up here at the nose, uh, the Jabiru 3300 six-cylinder 120 horsepower engine is what powers this guy and this is one of those unusual situations in aviation only two companies that I can think of that supply both an engine and an airframe of their own manufacturer this is one of the companies and this is the first one that I was aware of and Jabiru is an Australian company so the engines and the airframes are made in that down under country then shipped up here to the United States to Shelbyville Tennessee about near Nashville where they are assembled and then they're distributed out of Texas by US sport planes uh, that development is a fairly new development, but they're having a good first year of it, I was told. A composite structure, nose to back, nose to tail, including control surfaces and uh, wings and empennage. Steerable nose wheel on the front, sturdy main gear on the back. As you see on the wings here, the 31 and a half foot span wings with winglets on each end, that's one of the developments that came along later in this. So the J230, which is what describes this model, has been around a long time, uh, but it has gone through a few iterations. It was called the J230 S before. Now it's the J230D model. That's the newest one. And under the hood here, I mentioned that they made their own engines, but what we've got underneath here, I described its size, but this is a, called a Generation 4 or just simply Gen 4 engine, which has uh, some significant changes in how the engine was made. Uh, we'll leave the detail of that for another uh, discussion, another video, uh, but the engine is a smooth running engine. Uh, all the while we flew it today, it just purred along very, very nicely. It's a powerful engine too. It makes this airplane, which is a clean construction, scoot along very well in the sky, but also being pulled authoritatively by a strong engine. And those two combine very well to give both a good climb rate with a two blade prop and a good cruise speed. We saw numbers up to 120 knots easily and that was at low altitude. So at higher altitude where true airspeed can be more than 120 knots, you're going to get that out of this airplane. This is a cross country airplane and it does very well at that. But it exhibited some very nice uh, flight qualities and we'll touch on those too. I mentioned the third door back here and that that's an unusual feature in a light sport aircraft because these are two seaters. So what do you need three doors for? Well, having another door to load baggage is nice, but that's not why there's a third door on this airplane. It's that way because in Australia or in the United States as a kit plane, this can be a four seat airplane. So it has the structure to accommodate four seats, meaning it can go it can carry more than 1,320 pounds. That's just a placarded limit on this airplane in the United States, but it could carry more than that. So it's a very capable airplane, feels very solid in flight, but has also been refined over the years to, dis to uh, result in some very nice flight qualities. One of the changes they made with the airframe as it was upgraded along the way was to change the tailplane. And the camera probably doesn't show that very well, but the tail plane now, especially the vertical surface I'm look, thinking about, used to be uh, basically a flat plate. Now it is a shaped surface as it is on many aircraft and that has created some very nice qualities in its handling uh, and the stall characteristics are also very solid. Uh, so let me talk about each of those two a little bit. First of all, in-flight handling. Uh, the aircraft exhibits a very nice control harmony and by that I mean that the stick pressures and the rudder pedals uh, feel roughly the same. Of course your legs and your arms have different amounts of strength to contribute to that so it's a little hard to compare exactly without actually measuring them but my feel for it was that the amount of pressure on the rudder pedal, the amount of muscular effort to move the joystick very similar and nicely coordinated. So those are good things. It makes the airplane easy for a novice pilot to get in and not have to struggle with controlling the airplane. Although I found it responsive at slow and fast speeds and possibly the roll rate, I didn't actually measure it, but the 45 to 45 degree roll rate is probably in the neighborhood of about three seconds, which qualifies as brisk but not fast. And 
the good news about that is that it means that when you control, even when I was aggressive in moving a stick left or right uh, in coordination with the rudder pedals to try and see how fast I could bank it, it banks readily. You could easily handle this in crosswinds or turbulence and have plenty of control authority at any time, but never did it feel twitchy, which is very good. And again, goes back to uh, a younger a pilot with uh, less experience should have no trouble flying this airplane. So that said, let's talk about stalls a little bit because those two kind of relate. Um, a, a pilot with less experience may not always realize he's getting into a stall condition. Uh, and you're going to get lots of cues about this. Uh, the deck angle gets very steep. We saw a very generous deck angle when we used a little more power and a little quicker motion of the stick, which a student might do in a mistaken situation. You also get an audible stall warning and there's lots of clues to suggest including airspeed of course that you're getting near stall but even when we aggravated it with a fairly brisk rate of pullback on the stick and even with power or without power coming all the way back stick full and touching as far back as it could possibly go right up against the stops it never did actually break over it it the nose sort of said, look, I got to get flying again, and that's really all it did. We didn't even have to make any effort of recovery of it. Of course, you would do that. I'm not encouraging that, but it just shows that a student behind the learning curve is very unlikely to get in trouble with stall characteristics on this airplane. And remember, when we did that without power, it behaves that way even with no power. So uh, returning to normal flight is going to be a fairly easy thing to do. In flight, I mentioned that we saw numbers of uh, 120 knots. So you're right at the top of the category and beyond the category in true airspeed at altitude, which is permitted, of course. Stall speeds were right at the numbers they're supposed to be, which is 45 knots. And with some power on, with flaps down, we were seeing slow flight uh, right down to those numbers at which point the roll characteristics of the airplane and the rudder characteristics of the airplane were still good. Now, we went through a whole exercise. I asked Scott to show me uh, a typical demo flight for people operating the airplane or, or checking out the airplane for possible purchase. And we did turns with both aileron only and rudder only. So aileron only, you would normally get adverse yaw. And in many aircraft that I've flown, adverse yaw says you don't only not go the way you want to go right away, but sometimes you actually go the other way for a little bit. That's called adverse yaw, and it takes the nose and pulls it off to the wrong side that you're turning toward. This didn't do that. It delayed a little bit before it came around. That's to be expected when you're not using coordinated use of the controls. But the response was good, and the delay was uh, maybe two seconds or like that, and then the nose came around the right way. Again, not using any rudder pedal at all. It was pretty much the same in both directions. Uh, and with the uh, medium power on, which is I think about where we were when we did that, you would think that maybe one side would be more than the other because of a, of a P factor uh, going on with the prop. But of course we weren't angled too much, so the P factor wasn't a lot, but you still should see some difference in many airplanes. We didn't in this one. It was kind of the same both ways. Again, a credit to its ability to do well for a student pilot. Uh, then we did just rudder only controls. Now that's something you definitely don't do in many airplanes and a lot of times the airplanes don't cooperate very well. You've got to bury the rudder in order to get uh, much turning action in whatever direction you push the pedal. In this case it was actually pretty responsive and not only did the aircraft come around left or right when you used left or right rudder pedal, but the bank came in pretty quickly too, which again speaks to why the control harmony and coordination is easier on the pilot because the airplane is doing some of the work for you pretty clearly by that exercise we just demonstrated. So on the ground, uh, uh, full nose wheel steering. This is not a castering nose wheel. You steer it with the rudder pedals. Rudder pedals on both sides, by the way. Control stick in the center, but it has two handles. It's a U-shaped joystick and uh, either occupant can have his hand, his arm on the uh, center armrest and the uh, grip for your hand on that side is very comfortable the way your hand is normally placed. On both sides of the aircraft you have a throttle control. On both sides of the aircraft you have a push to talk button in addition to one on top of the joystick. And on both sides of the aircraft you have a flap control. That particularly is quite unusual, but it allows you to control the flap from either seat very easily without having to reach across the cockpit. Uh, we didn't use much in the way of, uh, of uh, cooling or uh, heating today. It was a pleasant day aloft, but it was, it was cool. And moving through the air, obviously the airplane is sealed up pretty well because we didn't use any heat and it was perfectly comfortable inside. 
but in a hot condition like it can be here in Florida or Texas where U.S. Sport Plains is based, uh, you st you'll see a difference now. The uh, NACA inlet here, uh, this is uh, serving the purpose of engine cooling in this case. That's going to change. This NACA inlet's going to come down about here and that will be used to vent the cabin and they can get rid of these window uh, locators uh, air inlets here and just use this one down here and I'm told that works very very well uh, but cooling of the engine is well, again it was a fairly cool day today pretty much standard atmospheric conditions but I didn't see the temperatures move hardly at all regardless of anything we did so engine cooling must be working pretty well and uh, I, we never got anywhere near temperature ranges that would have been problematical. I can't speak to what it would be like in really hot conditions, but my guess is that engine cooling would not be a problem then either, based on what I saw today. Seating inside the cockpit. Um, this airplane, I'm, I'm only of average height, and, and I can see right over the airplane here. So this, is, this airplane always strikes people, me included, as being kind of small when you walk up to it, and you wonder if you're going to fit inside. I flew with Scott Severin, who is six foot four, and looking at had him inside, he had at least five inches of clearance above the top of his head at six feet four inches tall. So clearly a pretty big guy can be in here. It's not quite as wide as some other airplanes. We're both of about average stature that way. Uh, we were not touching each other, but a couple of really big burly guys might be a little crowded in there compared to some other aircraft. Uh, but there's plenty of vertical height in there. And if you were particularly short and couldn't see over the panel, because the panel does come up a little high on you, some airplanes you can see a little more. When I raised myself up to look over there, what I was looking at then is the engine cowling, so it really wouldn't have benefited me to see much higher up. But if you were a really short statured person, you just use cushions. The seats are fixed in position, so cushions are the technique to adjust for different persons. Right, so um, inside the airplane, the uh, seats are fixed in position. There is an option for adjustable, adjustable rudder pedals. Let's say if you were using this in a training environment or something and you had people of different sizes all the time, that would be one option for you. This particular airplane did not have that. Uh, they work just as well. Uh, Scott and I are several inches different at height. I didn't experience any problem reaching the rudder pedals and it didn't look crowded for him either. So the position must be pretty good, but if you want adjustment, that is an option on the airplane. A couple of last little details here before we wrap up about the uh, panel and how it is configured. This particular one we were in and the camera, inside cameras will show, uh, uses a Garmin, the full-size Garmin G3X Touch, which is a beautiful uh, production. That company has done a really good, nice job of it. All touch screen, very, very handy to use. And one screen is really all you need. And in this one here, we were accented with, you can kind of see over here on the left side, the right side of the airplane, uh, he used uh, one of the larger iPad uh, on, a, on a swivel mount and that provides a whole lot of extra information. Those two are plenty enough, but uh, U.S. Sport Planes does offer a dual Garmin G3X installation if you want that. Uh, honestly, I don't see how you need it, but uh, for some people who want to have uh, both sides with the same equipment on it or just that much more screen, well, it's available to you. Uh, the airplane is sold out of Texas these days, uh, covering the whole North American uh, uh, space. And uh, U.S. Sport Planes is the company based in Texas. The engines and engine work is still done in Tennessee, in Shelbyville, Tennessee. And that's where the airplanes come into the country where they are assembled and then delivered to uh, Texas and from there off to their customers. The company has enjoyed a pretty good first year of that new distribution after many years in the hands of Pete Karate, who finally took retirement. And now it's in the hands of Scott Severn, who runs U.S sport planes. You can get more information directly from the source here at one of two websites. You can go to ussportplanes.com or jabberulsa.com and I've got lots of information about this airplane, its other companion airplane, the 170D, and lots of other affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for coming along with us in the Jabberu J230D. Don't miss the 15th Annual Sport Aviation Expo at the Sebring Regional Airport, January 23-26, 2019. The Sport Aviation Expo provides the opportunity to review aircraft and do demo flights. The event features light sport aircraft and includes kit planes, powered parachutes, trikes, gyros, amphibians, drones, ultralights, motor gliders, PPGs and electric powered aircraft. With over 150 different aircraft on display, including the Jabiru line of light sport aircraft. 
Sebring is a show where attendees can spend time with factory reps, checking out their dream plane, hanging out in the forums for the day, or just passing the time hanger flying, with friends old and new. There's also a long list of great speakers with talks ranging from informative to inspirational. Again the dates for the U.S. Sport Aviation Expo, at Sebring Regional Airport, Sebring, Florida are January, 23-26, 2019. We look forward to seeing you there.